Welcome, everybody, for uh, yet another edition of the Rising Tide Foundation Lecture. There's a lot of uh, old faces here, old friends that I haven't seen in a long time. So um, I'm really, really happy that, uh, that we're, we're bringing a lot of uh, friends together and uh, really just coming together for the right reasons at a period in time in world history, which really requires that people embrace a serious love of ideas, of discoveries, and of communicating those discoveries uh, because otherwise, what's the purpose of life, right? If we make discoveries and just keep them with us until uh, our body's rotting in the grave, there's really, eh, it's not it doesn't go very far. So uh, we have had uh, a really wonderful series of, of lectures over the past eight or nine months uh, going through various topics of the American system that's been mostly scrubbed out of history, uh, universal history, the techniques of, of thinking of Frederick Schiller, of Plato, um, going back to the days of, of Solon and all the way through the present. We've had classes on poetry, on music, on painting. And uh, in this particular little mini cycle, um, we, it began with a, a wonderful presentation by, by Anton Chaikin, where he got to showcase some of the, the historic discoveries he's put together in his new book, uh, Who We Are. Um, we had another class by Martin Seif, um, the journalist and friend who's given a, a great class on... Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's last mad crusade and some of the, uh, the underappreciated dynamics that got us into um, as a society, a completely unnecessary dynamic of wars after the death of Teddy Roosevelt. I said, sorry, not after the, scratch that, after the death of McKinley in 1901. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of listening to Nancy Spanis, um, who's going to showcase uh, some of her recent work uh, which is just groundbreaking. I mean, her website, American System Now, is, as I think most people here are aware, is one of the most pioneering sites anywhere online uh, showcasing the lost traditions, the forgotten traditions of America um, as a constitutional republic that created uh, out of the revolution, out of the constitutional convention, a new system of political economy, uh, which has, again, all but been erased from modern textbooks of political science, of economics, but... Uh, which offers the sole salvation for humankind as a species uh, to this very day. And that's not hyperbole for those who, who are not already aware of this fact. So they can go to Nancy's website, americansystemnow.com, that she um, has created recently uh, as a part of a program with her husband, Ed, as well as read her book, uh, Hamilton versus Wall Street, which is available on Amazon. Uh, there will be a link in the description to this video. Um, one of the key things that one of the biggest obstacles that we're facing right now to uh, America's ability to save its own soul at a time of, of existential crisis is a connection that the citizens have towards the real roots that gave birth to the revolution. And I know as a Canadian, as you know, giving one example, it was very, my entire life, I was always pummeled with the idea that thank God I'm not American. That's a society built on hypocrisy. That's what we were, we were told by our history teachers. It's a society built on hypocrisy. It's built on uh, the idea of all men are created equal, but in reality, it was really just slave owners who didn't realize that life would be so much better if they just stayed with the peaceful approach of the British system, like us good Canadians. And it was only much later in life that uh, I realized that, that I was hoodwinked. Um, unfortunately, a lot of Americans are also being fed something very similar. Um, and this is a real, real danger for America's ability to, again, like I said, overcome the uh, different manipulations that are pushing it towards civil war and disintegration. So with that said, Nancy, I know you have a lot to say, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay. So this is a work in progress, friends. Um, I was asked if I had anything prepared, and I said I could prepare something because as if you followed the website at all, my blog at all, you know, I've been very involved in this latest uproar about Hamilton being an enslaver. And I've been very involved overall in the trying to indicate what the solution is to the crisis that we're in, in Hamiltonian economics. Um, my, I, a long time ago, actually, uh, before this whole eruption around Hamilton, I did write, do a post saying Hamiltonian economics aimed to end slavery. 
And if people don't understand that, I think we are in serious trouble, as Matt said, because a moral approach against slavery, while extremely important, has to be linked together with a moral approach to political economy. And if you cede political economy to the British, then you are lost. Um, so let me go through what I prepared and hopefully uh, your questions will help me improve it. Um, beginning. Okay, do you see that? Yes, we yep. can. All right, very good. So this is the question ahead of us. Hamiltonian, the connection between Hamiltonian economics and the persistence of slavery. Now this issue really became red hot, as you probably know, with the 1619 project of the New York Times, where they decided on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of the first slaves from Portugal arriving in the United States. Uh, they were not requested here by the citizens of, that were in Virginia, um, that to write a major piece on the issue, which said that this was the real beginning of America. Um, America was not yet America, but this was the moment it began. And that got major play um, and it became an avalanche really when we saw over the course of this year, these atrocious murders by the police of black men and actually recorded atrocious murders. Not that atrocious murders hadn't happened before, but now with the police and other people having cell phones and cameras at their beck and call, uh, they were able to record it. And this really, as a pulled together with the New York Times propaganda push, making for an incredibly uh, hot situation. And one that has led people to go way uh, overboard, in my view, to root out anyone who ever said anything that is not today politically correct on slavery, including taking down or threatening to take down statues of Lincoln and so forth. Now, the latest move in this whole direction came from a young woman who's a docent at the Schuyler Mansion in Albany, New York, Schuyler being the father-in-law of Alexander Hamilton. And, you know, she's been steeped in Hamilton and so forth. And she, but she decided a couple of years ago that she would look into this slavery question and go over his papers. And she wrote a paper, I think it was actually a good number of months ago, early last, early last year. But the New York State Parks Department actually put it online uh, just about a month ago, month or two months ago, uh, and was immediately picked up, Hamilton's an enslaver. I'm not gonna go through the details that show how flimsy, erroneous, and outrageous that was. I refer you uh, to my blog where I have links to the definitive to a pretty strong rebuke by Hamilton scholars uh, who do what I couldn't do and go through wills and correspondence and all kinds of things uh, in great detail to show the actual misrepresentations uh, and prejudices that are involved in this conclusion. Now, this is an important question. Uh, that has been raised, however, what were, was the foundation of the United States a commitment to slavery uh, and benefit from the wealth of slavery? Or was there all, 
the commitment of the United States to being a, I would almost say a foot in the door for a society based upon the ideals that are outlined in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Because even those who were the strongest in proposing that knew that they weren't absolutely achieving it at the time, but that was what this republic, a unique republic, was going to actually accomplish. So it's a very important question, and it's one that it, that many Americans are probably genuinely confused about, uh, not to mention people in the rest of the world, unless you're some of those who take as gospel truth what is written in the Washington Post and the New York Times, uh, which we all recommend that you do not do, of course. So the, the key here, in my view, is Alexander Hamilton, the most anti-slavery of any of the founding fathers, uh, if you don't count Gouverneur Morris, but I think actually in action, Hamilton was more. And the person whose political and political economic ideas we so desperately need today. Uh, and I really, therefore, will feel at a certain point, many of you are familiar with it, with what he was proposing to do that would end slavery. But uh, let's start with setting up the situation of what it actually was like in the United States at the time of the founding. So what was the situation around slavery in 1789? Now, this is not complete. You know, I don't have all the facts and figures, but I'm going to give you some salient ones, which I think orient us in the right direction. So first, I got this map from the a researcher, or was he the chairman? Mm -hmm. The chairman mm -hmm. of the African American History Museum in New York City, in uh, Washington, D.C. And he came out to Loudoun County and gave a lecture about slavery. And he showed that when you look at the that it was important to see that in the overall scheme of things, uh, the amount of slavery of slaves that were taken from Africa were minuscule, relatively speaking, to North America compared to where they went elsewhere. And this was uh, all the European major powers were involved in slavery, the Portuguese, the uh, French, the British. Uh, ironically, many of them, including when they took action against slavery, so-called, uh, made a very sharp distinction between what was going on in their home country and what was going on in, in their colonies. The colonies, you could do whatever you wanted, the home country, they were anti-slavery because they had no slaves in their home country. Therefore, uh, this is one of the things that I think the British rely heavily on in their hypocrisy about this whole question, because while they had slavery rampant all over the Caribbean, India, and the colonies in Africa, they nonetheless uh, said, well, you don't see slave plantations in Great Britain like you do in the United States. Well, there's, you really can't have plantations in Britain uh, due to the geography. So uh, all it means is they had a totally different uh, policy for those they considered in the homeland and those that were international. So the of course, the British West in the West Indies were a major center of the slave trade. And uh, it was the sugar trade. It was a major source of wealth, dramatic, not only for Britain, but also for France. Um, enormous, as we as you guys saw when Jerry did his talk on Haiti, um, to know exactly how important this was 
to the empire's finances. And the key institution from Britain's side is the Royal African Company. Um, they are begun by King Charles II, in the middle of the 17th century with the restoration, uh, and then they become uh, more, uh, they lose their monopoly around seven, six, you know, 1698, 1700, uh, but that just means that they get to be a bigger operation uh, with more people involved. And the British dominate the African slave trade financially all the way through uh, uh, the next 150 years, minimum. So, and in the, in the colonies, uh, it grows. Um, it grows differently than it grows in the Caribbean, uh, where the death rate was, where they worked the slave, literally worked the slaves to death and just, just imported more. Here, there was a much lower death rate. They were kept around, uh, but it was brutal uh, and it expanded gradually over the course of the 17th century and into the 18th century. Um, with a heavy emphasis in the uh, southern colonies where it was profitable or where they had large plantations to employ the slaves. Uh, and the slave market uh, was heavily in, uh, in that area as well, not just the plantations. So uh, the biggest one was in Charleston, South Carolina. Ed and I visited here last December, uh, and they still have a museum in the place. This was the is the is the building where the slave mart was, where they actually brought the slaves that were imported, uh, put them in, you know, fattened them up, or you know, made them presentable for sale, uh, kept them jailed, and so forth. They didn't show you that, but uh, it was a very sobering place to visit. Um, but there was a totally different tradition at the same time. I mean, how many people today? I mean, I, it amuses, it fast tickles my, my imagination to think that if Raphael Warnock who's running for Senate in Georgia would raise the fact that Georgia was based, was established as an anti-slave society, uh, how he would throw his banner into things. Uh, in that area. Uh, but Georgia was established uh, in 1733 on the basis of um, taking prisoners, mostly debt pr prisoners who were in debtor's prison from England and uh, trying to set up a going colony and, yeah, in which they did not use slaves. This is exactly what Oglethorpe had to say. From the very beginning, uh, South Carolina uh, magnets were very much uh, upset about this. They didn't want to see uh, a different kind of system, uh, alternative, available. And after all, the slaves might leave and go to to Georgia, I don't know if very many did, but there's probably research done on that. Uh, so there was a constant fight where the South Carolinians, Linians tried to build up agitation among the settlers there saying, why should, basically saying, why should you do all this hard work? Why you should import slaves to do it. Um, and uh, that created a whole lot of uproar. And with the support, of the British financial interests uh, and the crown. Eventually, by I guess it was uh, 1750, uh, Oglethorpe was kicked out and uh, slavery was institutionalized in Georgia. But that's a tradition that has been buried. Now in the rest of the colonies, um, you had a different kind of political economy. Uh, you did have slaves. There was no, no 
colony in which you did not have slaves, including Massachusetts, but you had a much stronger tradition, a uh, very active tradition uh, against slavery, largely based on religion. Um, you had the Quakers and you had the uh, Congregationalists and so forth. On Massachusetts, uh, I'll deal with a little bit later, but mostly you can find the work on that on the blog in the two articles by Colin Lowry, uh, who can also talk to you about them. When I leave any time for discussion. Anyway, the first national, the first anti slavery abolition society in the world was not in Britain uh, or Canada. Uh, it was uh, established in Pennsylvania by Anthony Benazet. Benazet was a Quaker. He had been agitating for uh, a decade or two prior to this time. He wrote this major document, which is really worth reading, in 1766, a caution and warning to Great Britain, documenting from his interviews with people the horrendous crimes that were being carried out in the course of the slave trade. Uh, and then he, uh, in 1775, set up this society. Now, just a footnote, the society did not initially call for the abolition of slavery. What it called for was the, uh, it's, a, it's a mouthful, as most headlines in 18th century documents are. It was a society for relief of free Negroes unlawfully held in, band, in bondage. So it was for relief. It was for better treatment uh, and education, as you see in this uh, drawing here, because Benazé was determined that there be education for the enslaved and uh, for also for free Blacks. Um, so this pamphlet, by the way, I don't remember the, the uh, numbers, but Colin probably does, on uh, circulated extremely widely, including, and, and this was an international operation um, in many respects. So it circulated in London. Uh, I believe it was translated into French. Uh, the, uh, it was creating something that Colin knows a lot more about than I do, and I don't think I necessarily have the time to go into an international, across Atlantic anti-slavery movement, which of course is very important because a lot of the finances for the slave trade were coming from those sources. So Massachusetts, again, I, I refer you to, to Lowry, but particularly uh, it, the agitation there and the, the writings against slavery began very early in the uh, 17th century. But uh, as the situation with the British heated up um, and the oppression increased, uh, it became much more active, particularly with James Otis in, I think, 1767. Uh, and then the Massachusetts legislature, it wasn't a legislature, it's general court, uh, began to try to end the slave trade, to abolish slavery. They passed various laws. And every time the governor, of, uh, who was the king's servant, obviously, uh, would cancel them. That kind of thing happened also in Virginia. Um, including in Virginia that one of the measures that the, that the uh, legislature took was to put a huge, almost confiscatory tax on the importation of slaves. And that passed, <coughs> but then it was uh, nullified by the British authorities because uh, the slave trade was too much of a big source of income for uh, them to give up. Now, uh, this was not just single colonies, the entire United Colonies, who met in the First Continental Congress, 
voted to stop the importation of slaves, and uh, that was continued. So basically, you had no importation. Um, probably there were exceptions, but in general, the, the policy uh, from 1774 forward um, <clears throat> until the until the revolution was won. Now, um, in the meantime, as after the the a revolution was one. Um, you did have a proliferation, basically, of <clears throat> uh, moves to free the blacks. As far as there are various readings, but you know that there were black regiments. I think the first in the Revolutionary War. I think the first one was in Rhode Island. Uh, there were observers here uh, from France that indicated a fairly large percentage of the military forces they saw were, uh, were Blacks who escaped the, uh, and were, were promised their freedom, even though officially the proposal for that failed. Um, the, I think John Lawrence of South Carolina actually was ultimately allowed to raise a uh, black regiment. Uh, Washington thought it might be a dangerous idea and didn't want to do it, but then acceded to it uh, very quickly because they were good and necessary fighters. So um, that was uh, the import. And but the move, so the move after the war sort of like after World War II, the move for civil rights, because the Blacks were so involved in World War II, Black soldiers were so involved in World War II, uh, continued. <clears throat> and uh, in 1792, the, for example, uh, Virginia changed its laws on manumission to allow slave owners to manumit their Blacks, uh, their slaves. Now, before that, if you wanted to free your slaves in your will, you had to get special permission from the legislature to do that. 1792, no, they liberalized it. And there was a major growth uh, in the <clears throat> southern colonies, particularly the northern southern colonies, of uh, Blacks being freed after the war. I think it went from 1% of the population to three Blacks, about 10% is the figures that I've seen. So it's not a huge amount, and absolutely, but it's a pretty large increase. And you had abolition societies set up. For example, you have the New York Abolition Society. Uh, so you had 1775 had been the Pennsylvania one. Then in 1785, you have the New York Manumission Society. And shortly after that, um, <clears throat> there were, they were set up in Rhode Island, Delaware, and New Jersey, I believe. Um, ultimately, eight, all eight colonies had manumission, had abolition societies. Uh, Philadelphia changed their name to an abolition society in 1787. Uh, when other activities against slavery at this point, the Northwest uh, Ordinance, uh, just showing you the territory where that's 1787. Uh, interestingly, I had forgotten this, but rereading something today uh, noted that Jefferson's original 1784 proposal for banning slavery in the Northwest Territories actually said ban it as of 1800 which would have meant 16 more years of slavery before banning it. <clears throat> and that was rejected uh, because, I mean, for various reasons, but in part, and the Madison was even quoted saying, if you let, you let this thing go on for 16 years, I mean, you're not gonna get rid of it. So, um, but in 1787, they went ahead and outright banned slavery in those uh, territories. So that's the situation you get to 
on the eve of the Constitutional Convention. Now, at the Constitutional Convention, uh, very often considered a gathering of slaveholders. Um, from what I can gather, I can't really definitively say anything about this, but there were 50, there were 55 uh, who were actually there in the, as delegates. 25 were slaveholders, apparently. Uh, 11 of those plantation owners. So slave owners, you know, actually covers a, a lot of territory. But the mood was, as seemed to be indicated by the developments I was telling you before, um, was that slavery was on its way out. Uh, and that sooner, or that, that sooner or later that was going to happen. Um, and, but the question was how to deal with it as it was. Slave population, as far as I can figure at that time in the overall country was about 18%. But that went from something like 1% in the very northern colonies to 30 to 40% in South Carolina. Um, so that's a, a major uh, shift of uh, not your average. You can't take an average in that situation. Now, the leading anti slavery spokesman at the Constitutional Convention was Gouverneur Morris. He's a New Yorker, but he was representing Pennsylvania at the, <clears throat> at the convention. And he actually threatened not to sign if slavery wasn't condemned, but he ended up signing anyway. Um, very strong uh, remarks, however, about the atrocity and the hypocrisy. And on the other side, the extreme was John Rutledge of South Carolina. And he wanted to have Congress have no authority over slavery whatsoever. Now, what I'm going to go through here, you know, somewhat heavily depends upon a book that I reviewed on the blog called No Property in Man by Sean Lentz. I recommend that if uh, you want to get into it any uh, deeper. But the you know about the concessions that were made. The, the question of there were those in the South who wanted to cut, who wanted it both ways. They wanted the slaves protected under property rights, and they wanted to have them counted 100% in their population. Uh, the compromise was three fifths, um, and the uh, there was a vague, what Wilentz says was a relatively vague, unenforceable fugitive slave provision also put in there. And there was the continuation of the slave trade. Uh, not Well, the slave trade not being able to be a, a banned for 20 years. But the what was done in the course of this compromise, as Wilentz argues, is to provide real tools for those who intended to eliminate slavery. Uh, for one thing, it was made very clear, slaves were never, were treated as persons in the document, not as property. And the slave, no property in man, uh, is something that was written by Madison uh, when he was writing about the Constitution <clears throat> many years later. Uh, that they were extremely careful not to say that slaves were property, even though many of the Deep South people who were there strongly considered the slaves were property and uh, proceeded from that standpoint. But there were, so, but that's just the negative. On the positive side, what tools were left for those who intended to eliminate slavery? Well, one was to give power over the slave trade to the federal government. Remember, Rutledge wanted no power over the slave trade. He wanted it, you know, every 
as opposed to what happened, which was that slavery was considered a matter regulated by the states, right? Where states who didn't want it didn't have it, states who did want it uh, had it, and it was tolerated by the federal government. Uh, he wanted the federal government to legislate the right to slavery, um, which would have meant that, as was later attempted with the Dred Scott decision, that the states who didn't want slavery would not have the power not to have it. Anyway, they gave the power over the slave trade to the federal government, and that was something that they did not like. This is the clause, uh, which just says, and they also allowed taxes uh, on, on each person. Note. The other thing, very important, was to give the federal government power over what happened in the territory. <laughs> um, this is Article 4, Section 3. And that, of course, was quite relevant to the question of the expansion of slavery, uh, both from what it meant for the economy and the country as a whole, what it meant in the Congress, uh, balance of power, and so forth. Now, these were compromises, no question about it. Uh, the Georgia and South Carolina said that they would not join the Union if there was any action against slavery. And therefore, the nationalists um, would decided that unity of the country was the most, at this at time, was the most important thing. And Therefore, they made these compromises, fighting for as much as they could uh, to provide the tools to eliminate it. Um, but it was what was done was still seen as extremely dangerous. The the institution. Uh, there was a major uproar made by Patrick Henry at the ratifying convention in Virginia uh, about. Giving power, giving power, so much power to the federal government in the Constitution. If you give them all this power, they're going to free your slaves. Um, this wouldn't say slaves. Free your niggers. Oh, sorry, he said free your niggers. Uh, I, what I read cleaned up the language, <laughs> which is why I had the quote there. So, anyway, so the. It was, a, it was a standoff in some respects, um, but the South definitely uh, feared that there would be, that the, these feet in the door uh, were going to push it wide open. And that slavery, which felt politically as though it was on the way up, would actually be on the way up. Now, there are a couple things that I want to interpolate here that I don't have slides on that are I think are significant. Uh, from a document that Colin sent me just a couple days ago. Um, it's from a speech given by a uh, fellow um, in Cincinnati in 1872 on slavery, the, the state of slavery, the state of abolition in the United States prior to 1800. Um, and he goes through a partial, I mean, he doesn't have all the material that I've given to you so far, but he has a lot of it, a uh, discussion of what, how many abolition societies there were, how many members there were, all the petitions they sent to Congress, all the documents that they sent around, the orations and so forth. Uh, one example that he gives uh, which is, I think, I think quite interesting, uh, is on the city of Baltimore, because this whole thing began with him finding in the personal papers of George Washington a copy of a speech given by a, a fellow, a, a doctor, at a, the 
Maryland Abolition Society on July 4th, 1791. And this is a vicious speech against the continuation of the slave of slavery, not just the slave trade, but of slavery. Uh, calling, I mean, he attacks the Europeans up and down the line, but for having instituted it, leaving it as a legacy and so forth and so on. But he also very much, uh, you know, it's despicable, it's degenerate, it's, uh, you know, he's very virulent against the toleration of slavery continuing. And he received, you know, a lot of support uh, in the, uh, he, he wasn't attacked. No one, you know, came to his door to, with torches or, you know, anything of that sort. Um, so he indicates that kind of a sign of the, it, it piqued his interest in terms of the, uh, what was the political mood on slavery at that time. And he points out eventually in this speech that he's given that 40 years later, if you had given a speech like that in Baltimore, you would probably down if not being shot because there were people who were speaking out for abolition were actually being mobbed, having their presses destroyed being tar, you know, thrown in jail uh, for having made these same kind of statements. So it's an interest that was tended to be the mood. And on top of that then comes the political economy that I mentioned, the Hamiltonian threat to the slave system. Now, of course, he's treasury secretary and the treasury department is one of what, four departments? At the time. Four government cabinet posts at the time, and it's by far the most numerous and the most powerful, not to, you know, largely because also because he was so close to George Washington and thinking uh, and personally. And Hamilton's views were well known, right? He had promoted black soldiers in the revolution. He was a member actually at one point of president of the New York Manumission Society. Uh, he had given speeches indicating the abominate, you know, abominable nature of slavery. Um, and his economic policies called for increasing the strength of the federal government so that it might uh, be able to eliminate slavery. And the first, and that argument was a major one raised against his first bank of the United States. Hamilton's first bank was intended, as he said, to promote the credit, not only for the bonds of the United States, but for agriculture, commerce, and manufacturing. And that was the kind of society which was going to threaten the economic viability of slavery. Therefore, uh, and by having the this powerful institution, this large, you know, it's a mammoth bank compared to anything that existed in the United States, by consolidating the debts of all the states into the federal government and then using some of that money for the, to capitalize the bank, this created a uh, a situation where they were very much afraid, again, that the federal government had the power to eliminate slavery. And one of Jefferson's, uh, the cry again came from Virginia. If you can, if we let the first bank of the United States go through, uh, we, if we let Hamilton set up a bank, he's going to threaten our local institutions, i.e. slavery. Then, of course, there was his pro-manufacturing policy. Um, this was, as you're probably all pretty much aware, since you're aware of, of my work on Hamilton and the book, um, is the Passaic Falls in northern New Jersey, where he 
determined to set up his pilot project for the uh, for manufacturing. Now, I, I want to note that this is in New Jersey. And in New Jersey at that time, and, and in fact, up till 1808, women and blacks could vote. That blew me away, actually. I mean, you had, there was a, there was a uh, property uh, qualification. You had to own, you had to make a certain amount of money or own a certain amount of property. But if you had that, uh, the, uh, you were, you were allowed to vote. Um, and that, uh, I can't say that he employed free blacks uh, in the building of the Society for Useful Manufacturers, but I think it probably, uh, um, it, it's quite possible. Um, so anyway, the manufacturing policy you know about, um, it was, it was aimed to transform the United States from being a supplier of raw materials at the beck and call of the British free trade system and to uh, make the United States an industrial powerhouse, an agricultural industrial powerhouse. It was absolutely clear that this manufacturing perspective would aid the South by providing a market for their goods. Uh, he doesn't say anything about eliminating slavery, but he, he talks against cheapening labor. Um, because when people raise the objection to having manufacturing in the United States because labor costs too much, he says, that's okay. Paper costs so much. Okay, but uh, that's compensated for by the fact that our transportation costs are low and really can be lowered even more with infrastructure and that um, we have machinery that we can develop. I think he uses the term of the mechanical genius of the American people. And the infrastructure, infrastructure policy was a third aspect, which was really endangered the slave system because the more you had connection between, not only with markets, but in people uh, and information throughout the entire number of colonies, uh, the more likely it was that you would tell, you know, convince people uh, that this, the, the, the feudal system, the slave system, was something that they wanted to get rid of and they had an op opportunity to go somewhere else. And faced with that, it could be necessary. It could be necessary, yes for the Southern plantation owners to release their grip, so to speak. Um, the first canal, I was looking for the canals uh, that might have been, the infrastructure that might have been built by, uh, in the Hamilton era. We know there were a lot of post roads done. But the first canal that was done was actually in Connecticut. Uh, and urbanization. This, I love this picture because this is the cleaning of the water supply of Philadelphia uh, through the establishment of their waterworks. Um, the planning for this uh, waterworks was actually started in the 1790s. And this was the ultimate result. I don't think, uh, it, it came in two phases, but it was a new system of filtering. Uh, it was a developing of the urban culture, uh, raising the level of the standard of living through cities. And of course, uh, cities are not where you're going to have a mass slave economy. And you had roads. This is one of the first roads west uh, the Lancaster Pike in Pennsylvania. It's the first turnpike, I understand. Um, and that was also part of the idea of reaching into the interior, 
creating the basis to have a unified nation economically, politically, and socially, uh, which was what was necessary in order to have a, a functioning economy and which would represent part of the death knell of slavery. And of course, what I didn't mention was Hamilton's anti-free trade polemic in the report on manufacturers, because that uh, struck at the heart of it actually, as came up later in the, in the fights of the carries against slavery. Um, if you have a free trade system, which uh, means the British are the ones who are producing the goods and you're producing the raw materials, uh, you're going to essentially continue with that feudal operation. Now, the sabotage. This really begins with Jefferson, who is committed to eliminating that central centralized government economic system that Hamilton was putting into effect. He really wanted to get rid of the National Bank. He couldn't uh, because Gallatin said we're too. It's just, there's no corruption here and we need it. Of course, he used it for opposite purposes. He used it to pay down debt uh, and cut the revenues of the government to the point where they were unable to maintain the military. They decommissioned ships. Uh, they did not invest in infrastructure and the kind of buildup of the economy that was necessary. So the early decade of the 1800s, for many reasons, was a mess. But among them was the economic policy of the anti-Hamilton economic policy of Jefferson and his number two Treasury Secretary, Albert Gallatin. Um, this policy, of course, showed up its major shortfalls in the War of 1812, uh, when we had the, a near defeat <laughs> um, by the fact that we were so unprepared that we had no national banking um, and were, could not actually afford to take on the, uh, the British Navy. But he succeeded and afterwards there was a reaction to try to bring back Hamiltonian economics. Uh, starts with Matthew Carey, as you all know, which, who argues for, this, for, for Hamilton in particular, including the second bank, and that does come back. Um, and you begin to get, at this point, a move in the other direction, sort of policy where you, of manufacturing and protection, where you would actually have the conditions for eliminating slavery. There is a significant anti-slavery action in 1819, led by Charles Fenton Mercer, the father of the Sino Canal, who calls for the uh, and passes a law that declares the slave trade piracy. Now, technically, the slave trade ended in 1808, but in fact, when the Navy would would uh, interdict a slave ship, they would often put these, you know, give them to the states, and the states would sell these people back into slavery. Uh, so, the slave trade was continuing, and Mercer documented that. Uh, and he put through this uh, anti-piracy operation, which meant that if they, if you were an American caught trafficking in slaves, you could be sentenced to death. So it was a significant reflection, the fact that that passed in the Congress of the attitude shifted. Um, and this is uh, the way that Kerry was addressing the situation at that point. Um, that we have to go back to the policies of Hamilton in order to recover from what was a horrendous 
uh, situation after the war. There was a major depression in 1819 <clears throat> um, due to mismanagement of the first years of the bank and the overall international situation, uh, financial situation, probably some direct British intervention on this. Because the British were saying immediately after the War of 1812, there are quotes from Lord Wilhelm, I think it is, you know, we've got to bury U.S. manufacturers in the cradle. Uh, because in war conditions, those manufacturers tended, the manufacturing sector tended to come back a little bit because it was absolutely necessary. Um, but it was in danger of dying again under peace conditions when you're supposed to go back to free trade, uh, according to British economics. The situation does that Kerry was pushing takes off with John Quincy Adams, uh, his administration in 1824. He, of course, always anti-slavery. Um, and you get the canal era. This is uh, at Monocacy, uh, part of the Seno Canal. And this and the railroad era beginning with John Quincy Adams in 1828. Um, very important in spreading uh, the idea of progress and development uh, in areas where they've been stuck in this old feudal system. And then that changes back with Andrew Jackson, as you might know. And the excuse given for much of that is the cotton gin. And this is this is really something I'll just touch on because it deserves a lot more work. It's uh, this was it, practically anything you read about slavery in the United States will say, well, slavery took on a new life after the Constitution because of the cotton gin. Um, it, and what the cotton gin did was make it more efficient uh, to separate the seed from the bowl. Um, but there is, in my view, absolutely no sane reason you could give for why that meant that uh, you had to have an increase in slavery. You, needed, you had a, could have a more profitable cotton trade, uh, but why do you have to continue that with slaves? Uh, you didn't. Um, anyway, that the real cotton era, uh, this is 1793, but once you hit this period of relative peace, um, after the uh, War of 1812, and the uh, and you have Jackson taking over, the cotton situation really advances because the British take over finances. They take over the Jackson eliminates the National Bank. That is greatly to the benefit of Wall Street and its British financial backers. Uh, and the British become the economic dictators in many respects of the United States once again. At this point, you have a, another retrogression of laws on uh, for Blacks in the South. I mean, prior to this time, uh, it was not illegal in uh, Virginia, for example, to teach slaves to read. At this point, there was a new law passed saying that uh, banning gatherings of Blacks for education. So there was a real turn back. I mentioned the British economic power. This is Barclays Bank, one of the major funders of the Southern plantation owners and their expansion west uh, because um, the lion's share of the money, well, the lion's share of the cotton produced in the South, about as estimated 70 to 80% what was sold to Britain. Uh, a major amount of the finance for expansion and continued operation of that 
came from the British banks or their New York uh, correspondent banks. And this allowed the uh, expansion to the West. This is a Texas uh, cotton plantation established in that period. You know, creating, of course, all the political conflicts uh, over control of slavery in the territories uh, that we know. And then the real turning point comes with 1854, when the Supreme Court uh, rules that Dred Scott, uh, that it is, that, what is it, Illinois, which is where he was taken, that a state cannot uh, declare him free. Um, and basically saying that reversing the situation of the Constitution, that slavery is legal everywhere and except, you know, with local exceptions, but those local exceptions uh, were had uh, were time limited. I mean, Abraham Lincoln is the clearest on this. Uh, he's accused of having major conspiracy theory <laughs> about what was going on with the ruling in Dred Scott. But he was absolutely convinced that that this was a foot in the door to allow to allow suits against every state that banned slavery which was most uh in the east and uh say that those that those bans were unconstitutional because blacks could not be citizens uh and uh that was the national law so that was the turning point toward the civil war now, just quickly on the other side, um, because in the 1830s as well, you had a new wave of abolition activity. It was a problematic one uh, because the on the one side, you had the Garrisonites who were increasingly, I don't think at the beginning, but increasingly attacking the constitutional system and saying that uh, in order, saying that that was necessary because it was a moral abomination in tolerating slavery. And, um, and then you had others uh, who were attempting to deal with the economic side as well, the political economy side as well. Uh, but there was tremendous activity uh, at this time. This is the time, that I think, that you had the, yeah, this was the time of John Quincy Adams's uh, fight against the gag rule in Congress. This is the time of an expansion of, of pamphlets and uh, a lot of activity. This is Frederick Douglass's paper this is well, was established pretty late, uh, 1847, but uh, many others were uh, before that. Um, it's also in this period of the 1840s, 50s, that Henry Carey becomes very active in the fight against slavery. And in 1853, he writes, uh, article about a major book actually about which you can see what the title is and he argues that as I said at the beginning the political economy of your country is crucial in being able to extinguish slavery he's arguing for protection of industry um, more than he's taught writing about credit uh, and infrastructure, but he's but his concept of what protection allows definitely includes the expansion of education, the expansion of uh, upgrading of conditions of life with sanitation, transportation, 
and other aspects of infrastructure that we've talked about before. Um, so this opens that flank uh, saying that the way that we're going to, and, and this was very much uh, at the center of Alan Salisbury's work. And if you haven't read his book uh, about the uh, Civil War in the American system, and you definitely should. Um, what he's also addressing is the fact that if you have protection and you have an increase uh, in the in your manufacturing and your living standard, uh, you are going to induce those who are now wedded to the slave system to want to adopt a different system. Um, and there was no question about the fact that the South lacking that kind of industry uh, was extremely backward. Um, and there was a, it's really interesting. Um, Frederick Olmsted, you probably know him as the founder of the uh, creator of Central Park in New York, uh, was a, uh, I, I don't remember what his major, major occupation was, but he ended up doing a lot of traveling and off and saying that he was going to travel to the south of the United States. He was a New Englander, but not a big abolitionist by any means. Um, in fact, he thought the south was probably trapped into their situation and, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so hard on them. So uh, he decided that in his travels, you know, he wanted to go to take trips to the South and he offered the New York Times that he would send them his articles. So the New York Times said yes. And, um, and he wrote, I think, three volumes of observations on the situation in the South, which is, I've only read a short bit of it, but uh, it's, it's really incisive uh, and strong on exactly what the, the physical degradation of people, not just the Blacks, but also the Whites, the attitude that he picked up of people saying hard work is for slaves, uh, the uh, physical work is for slaves, um, the poor nature of the transportation network, the lack of habitation, the lack of concentrations of people. One of the major things that Harry, that Henry Carey was always talking about was the need for uh, increased interaction between people in order to have a vibrant economy. Um, and that, of course, involves having cities as well as transportation. And this was absolutely lacked. I'm not trying to imply Frederick Olmsted was talking about political economy. He was not. He was simply observing the state of life uh, in, play, in a place which had been abandoned to free trade and slavery um, and uh, made a very powerful picture. Um, Henry Carey absolutely agreed with the idea that you needed to have an industrialization of the country as a whole if you're going to get rid of the slave trade. And this is an evaluation he was giving to a senator in 1867, which directly links that. He says, well, you know, when did the chances for eliminating slavery peacefully really reach a turning point. Um, he says it's with 1833 uh, when Jackson eliminates the bank and a the high tariff that was put through in 1828 is reduced. And in other words, protection is eliminated. And at that point, um, he also adds, uh, and at that point he says uh, that the domestic, that the pro-slavery feeling 
began to take off. He points out, for example, that in 1831, right after a major, uh, one of the few major massacres of the slave revolt in Virginia, there was actually a convention in Virginia where it was on the table to abolish slavery, he said. But after the changes of the Jackson administration, that was dead. Now, you could make an argument, there are other reasons why that was dead, but for sure, there was a whole avenue cut off at that particular point. Um, he also makes the point in another letter about a couple railroads which were which Lincoln had proposed to be made into the Northern South, uh, which would consolidate them into the more into the national industrial economy uh, and create a further basis for eroding support for slavery, economic and political and moral. I mean, everybody knew it was immoral, but the uh, uh, but these policies could not take, did not take hold uh, in the post-Jackson era until Lincoln. And the core, as he said, is raise the value of man. And you do that through industrialization. You do it through uh, and everything that involves. And that's I think what I want to say. Thank, Thank you, Nancy. That was that was great. And I, I think that it really sets the stage so nicely for next week's class by Larry Freeman, who's going to go through Alexander Hamilton in Africa as well. So I think that you've done a really, really synergistic job here, just setting the stage for that and, and just opening up the door for hopefully a, a Good little discussion. If anybody has any questions, now's the time. What I'm going to say, um, because again, as has been the theme, the chats don't work. So there is an option under the participants. If you go to the bottom of your Zoom window and click on participants, uh, there is an option to raise your hand if you want to pose a question or, or offer a thought uh, to Nancy or directly here visually on your camera. You could just raise your hand and I'll take note and call upon you. Uh, so that being said, okay, we got Lazarus, who has a thought or a question. Go for it, Lazarus, but you're on mute. Yeah, uh, yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, so I have this question for Nancy, and I was um, writing it down. Um, I thought it was interesting how industrialization and the improvements of the improvements of transportation network and infrastructure, like canals, railroads, or even just roads, that creates you know, more con interconnections, um, interconnectivity between people uh, from distant areas in the United States. And as such, that would, um, and I, I can't really point out the direct dynamic of that, but that would, that, that, that had a tendency to decrease the support of slavery and increase the support of abolition. Now, would deindustrialization entail the opposite? And from my, um, and I know I like talking about this so much. I've noticed a lot of people who are, um, you know, they're open about their racism. They tend to hate industry and they really look at that chapter of American history. They're very sympathetic to Jeffersonianism. Uh, they're very sympathetic to the South and they, uh, they view industry as evil. They, they think that industrialism is evil. They think it's a product of Satan. And I wonder if there is that sort of dynamic going on here. That's very interesting, because um, I think a lot of the people here who are considered the more racist are people who are upset about losing their industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Usually an industry means you have a strong army to protect your nation and a, a basis for to uphold nationalism. But when America is involved, or even no, I'm thinking more direct, I mean, like, coal miners, for example, right? Or, you know, people who used to be in the 
in the eliminated sections of the steel industry and the, you know, well, auto workers and stuff like that, machine tools. So. And this is just from observing um, dialogues between people who, um, you know, they call themselves traditionalists, they're part of the alt-right. And they're not so much like the Archie Bunker type of racists. They're more like, they're more uh, quote unquote philosophical minded. They're thinking, <laughs> well, Europe's best days are when we had feudalism. And, you know, get rid of industry, you get feudalism back. We're in uh, what we consider what we consider the golden age. Wow, where are these people? Um, it, they are people who, re I've ran into those people in various circles, uh, mainly those who read, read from uh, histor uh, historians and writers like Julius Evola, uh, Oswald Spengler. Um, oh. There are people who really, you know, they, uh, what's that guy, what's that German guy's name? Um, uh, oh, um, I, I think I know who you mean. Yeah, Martin Heidegger. They're, they're also followers of Martin Heidegger. Oh my God. Well, so they're, <laughs> pseudo, <laughs> they're pseudo intellectuals. Yeah. <laughs> It's a, it's a strain within the uh, within a global traditionalist movement. It's a strain from from within them. Uh, it's a much larger group actually. We have them in the Islamic world also. They are very much pro what this guy is talking about. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's pretty. That's pretty dangerous. I would say um, keep those people out of power. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I have been observing them for uh, for a little over a decade now, and I've been I chime into what they're talking about, how they're talking about things, and the reasons for why that why they are doing that. And I don't think they're anti-industrial. You know, they talk about oh, we want to go back to the days of, of this pristine blue sky paradise that we call medieval Europe or antebellum South. And well, you just have to tell them they're lying. Because yeah. that's what is and wasn't what it was like. Yeah. Are these people with money or are these people who are poor? Um, their, their wealth is variable. A lot of them are people around my age, millennials, some Zoomers, maybe some early Gen Xers. But they're, uh, you know, they're, they're like these sort of like, bur you know, kind of burnouts from society. Uh, do they um, still work? I don't know. I don't really get too much in their personal lives. But I had imagined. I mean, work, work that can provide a, a, some orientation, to have to work some orientation to reality, even if you yeah. have a wacko job, you know. I mean, yeah, a lot of them are probably in the service sector. And even if you're in, like, you know, you, you could be someone who gets decent pay in an office job, you know, you're making even six figures, but if you don't have this sort of meaningful work, you kind of retreat into this sort of la la land that, um, that I'm talking about. Hmm. Yeah, I've, I've had, uh, it, it's good to get a little subjective sometimes. I, I've had people who've come up to me saying like, you know, they're off the grid, they're self-sufficient and all of these things. And uh, they're saying this in, you know, Montreal, where I live, a city, very small, 3 million people. And I just asked them like, well, did you eat today? Where do you think that came from? Did you make it yourself? Did you get um, from the grocery store or did you actually get from the farm or raise it yourself? Yeah, like seven months of the year, it's, it's winter, you know, like, come on. <laughs> Um, all right, we got it. Strangely enough, we got somebody else entering the room a little bit late here. I don't know who that is. Uh, all right, if there's any anybody else who has a thought or a question uh, for Nancy, you could just raise your hand or you know just chime in. Um, I could see you. So I have I have a question. If nobody wants to take the the spot right now, um, <clears throat> Nancy, you you mentioned that. Uh, um, I had a lot of questions actually, um, but I guess the one that um, gets me right now is uh, on the issue of of Jefferson. And I I've had a lot of people who um, are on my website and, and communicate with me like Jefferson a lot. Um, I've had some people even send me the quotes from his early years where he was advocating getting rid of slavery. Um, and sure enough, it seems like he had a lot of potential and he did good things when he was younger. Um, but what is it that you would say really caused his, his moral collapse into his years as the president? Um, because it did seem like, again, he really didn't want to have slavery as a permanent institution. He was sort of, re he, he recognized it was immoral. He even had discussions 
with um, who's the um, African American uh, architect who helped design? Oh, Banneker. Banneker. Had, Banneker. Well, Benjamin Banneker. Yeah. He, had, he did have a thing with Benjamin Banneker, um, uh, who did an almanac, you know, and was recognized. Um, well, I think there are a couple things. I mean, most people think it was two. It was that it was two things. It was he couldn't see how to do it peacefully, right? Mm. Because of the uh, because the later you the longer you waited to do this, and the more slaves you had there, you know, the more difficult, right? It, it would be to handle socially. But secondly, the uh, he was the guy was in total debt all his life, right? Mm -hmm. And he economically depended upon this, and he didn't have any perspective for getting out of it, right? And so he relied on it. Now that doesn't. I, I read one book about Jefferson which talked about him as basically being unable to deal with reality. That he was an, you know, that he was a, he loved to be in the, in the, in the realm of ideas, right? But he really couldn't handle, you know, doing anything. I mean, he tended to delegate everything to anyone else. He wanted an argument made. He asked Madison to do it, right? Uh, he wanted a, you know, an attack on Hamilton. He asked some journalist to do it. He, you know, he didn't, this guy, it was a very psychoanalytic kind of thing, but it had some ringing of truth to it, uh, I thought, in terms of, of psychologically. This paper that Colin gave me that I just read about, uh, this guy, thought that uh, he, he put a lot of emphasis on the fact that Jefferson couldn't accept the idea that blacks were had equal intelligence to people of other races, um, to, to the white race. Um, he tended to be soft on that and saying, well, he just, because in the notes of Virginia, where he says that he can't see that blacks have equal mental facilities and therefore couldn't be equal citizens, uh, that uh, he just doesn't have, he said he's somewhat tentative and says, well, you know, I don't know, maybe this is because I have never met anybody you know, I haven't met enough people and uh, it would take a lot of observation to determine whether what I say is true or not. But, you know, there, I think if anybody as smart as him, you know, you wouldn't need to have observation to know that it's, that to the degree that you see people destroyed mentally, it's because of their conditions of slavery, for goodness sake. And the uh, and there were plenty of examples of people around, of very smart black people around um, that he could, if he needed to have examples, but I don't think you need to have examples. So anyway. Who, who is this you're talking about now, man, Nancy? Thomas Jefferson. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Ed wants to say something. All right, but Jefferson is a, I mean, he's a blood and soil agrarian and he hates cities, he hates industry. He's very explicit about this. So that it's a built in backwardness in feudalism to have that outlook and his notes on Virginia. I mean, Tony Chaikin's new book has a really a beautiful section on the notes on Virginia, which I, I'd never realized how evil this is. Um, but if you are an agrarian in, the, in trying to hold back industrialization, where does that take you? 
Mm -hmm. Right. We have a, um, thank you. We, we have a question from Lamari, then Mary. So Lamari, go for it. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, I think you just went through it briefly, but could you say more about this, um, the argument that's being made by the, this woman, Jessie Serfilippi, on why Hamilton is an enslaver? I, I, I haven't gotten a chance to read it, so I was just kind of curious about what their logic is behind that. Oh, well, she goes through, uh, she goes through his letters his account books um, and finds things, some census records. She actually had an error in one of the census records and found an, a guy named Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. in New York that he, who had slaves at a time when Alexander Hamilton was living in Philadelphia. Um, oh, interesting. <laughs> so I mean that's the most blatant thing, but there are others, you know, and but but she, I mean to me, you have to read uh, the um, what's the name of my friend? Um, yeah, it, well Philo Philo Hamilton and uh, Newton. What, Newton Michael Newton's reputation of it. Uh, which is in the, if you look at my coverage of this, I link to that. And it's, a, it's a long document which goes through all her sources and tells you which ones are totally off the wall, which ones she's just looking at in the wrong way, and which ones are unresolved. I mean, there are three different kinds of things. But I mean, I would start with what she says about uh, about his history, because uh, Chernow says, and many people have said, that the fact that Hamilton grew up surrounded by slavery in the Caribbean, uh, that that disposed him to be anti-slavery. Um, although one doesn't have any direct statements of Hamilton to that effect. Um, she says, by growing up in the Caribbean and seeing, uh, being surrounded by slavery, uh, Hamilton learned that slavery was the way to get rich and that's what he wanted to do and that was his. So, I mean, she's just, she's projecting in, in my view because the popular thing is to root out enslavers, right? And so she looks, I mean, she even says that the clearest, one of the clearest things from the 1790s is Hamilton talking to, I forget who, it's in, it, it's in his letter. Uh, maybe it's to Jay directly. When Jay is doing the, the Jay Treaty, and the Jay Treaty, uh, in one of the issues that he was to, that Jay was to discuss with the British was that the British insisted on discussing was, uh, you know, that the Americans was, insisted on because it was in the treaty was that the slaves that the British freed should be returned to their owners, right? Um, although it's unclear whether at what time they were enslaved, et cetera, et cetera. And Hamilton says, you know, don't worry about that. Uh, it would be morally repugnant to return anybody to slavery. So, but she says, well, he only says that, you know, because it was the politic thing to do at the time, you know. So she takes his anti-slavery act, and then she doesn't deal at all with his anti-slavery activity in the Manumission Society and, uh, and otherwise. So it's a, uh, and, and on, in terms of him owning slaves, there are two family members who say two things. One, one son says he never owned a slave. His, he has a grandson who says he did own slaves. 
Well, you're going to believe the grandson instead of the son? Well, she does because. Now, there, I'm not saying that there aren't a couple transactions in his financial books that look like he's being a banker for his family and slaves. Mm. But that's true. And, you know, my friend who wrote the blurb for my book, you know, has a great book on the illustrated Alexander Hamilton, where he, you know, gives a certain amount of credence, says you don't know, right? You just don't know. But the, uh, but the likely explanation, but, but both sides are guessing on that. And the likely explanation is that he's hiring these people not buying people and uh, because of all the other things around it. And she doesn't deal with the other things around it. She says, well, part of his identity was to become rich. The way to become rich was to have slaves, you know. Yeah. And she, she fits all of her data into her, um, yeah. The, what, into her the paradigm. She, she sets up a, mm -hmm. she sets a up preconceived a idea. So, and she just, I mean, to me, of course, my angle is, is different from Michael Newton and Philo Hamilton, you know, because they don't deal with Hamilton's economic policies and the principles behind it, you know. So they're just dealing with the facts, right? Mm -hmm. but, but they're also dealing with the fact that he did this stuff in the Manumission Society. And he was the chief lawyer for the New York Manumission Society after in 1798 on which meant that he was you know, trying to keep Blacks from being sent back into slavery. He was president of the society. He was on the committee that, uh, that recommended that everybody in the society had to get rid of their slaves. Well, if he had slaves, what was he doing that for? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't compute. Right, right. Interesting. Um, Thank you, Nancy. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Nancy. Um, Mary at watchdemocracygrow.org has a question. Mary, go for it. Can you hear me, Mary? You are on mute if you don't know that yet. Can you? Oh, hello? Yes, do you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Yes, I am using the phone because uh, the desktop uh, audio is a little bit challenging, but I want to thank uh, Nancy for the wonderful work that uh, she has done. Uh, my question was for next session on Hamilton in Africa, are you sharing with the, at least uh, a few of the African groups and others so that, because uh, to me, I really appreciated tonight's discussion in terms of history and education. And uh, originally, I come from Africa, so the transatlantic knowledge that we usually get was just that of exit, but then you don't get more of how the system that was existing then was actually uh, facilitating the, 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 the need for the, for the recurative slavery business that was going on at the time. So, for the purposes of education, and sometimes if we want to change it societies, education is a key factor also on that. Uh, are you planning to reach out to, to, I would be open on whom I would consider that majority who have been part of that journey so that they understand, because sometimes I get invited to, to different churches on such kind of topics, and one of the topics I gave out was like, Actually, during the time of slavery, there was economic crisis that other immigrants who are coming from Europe were facing, that the only option from a human perspective is always to get those ones who are a little bit easier to, you know, it, it, I think the development, economic development at the time was based on that because I come from Africa and I know that also actually uh, slavery was existing there. The, the, the more wealthy you were, the more slaves you could get, and uh, also the issue of uh, polygamy in Africa. Sometimes he read it. 
whereby the more women you have, the more wealthy you become. So uh, uh, do you plan to at least reach out to uh, Africans and uh, blacks in general on this uh, impressive work? I'm sure Larry Freeman was reaching out to Africans. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Larry Freeman has, has amazing contacts across Africa and many organizations, and he has said he will be doing a lot of outreach to make sure that people know about his lecture and have the Zoom uh, link, which, by the way, if you also uh, know good people who you would like to invite, um, send me an email or send us an email at uh, info at risingtidefoundation.net. So just send mm -hmm. an email to that email account. So it's info at risingtidefoundation.net. And I will ensure that, uh, or Cynthia Chung will ensure that you get the Zoom link when we make, when we schedule it. And that way, again, just mm -hmm. feel free for good quality people that you know of or organizations, you can feel free to do some outreach. And certainly Larry, uh, Larry Freeman will go through a lot of very edifying material, uh, which I think will-, will Thank be you. Great. Yeah, Larry, Larry uh, says Hamilton's book, my, my book on Hamilton is very popular in Africa. And so I hope. Oh, you thank you. I hope you've seen it. <laughs> no, he has, he has seen it. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you, you'll be able to pick up Nancy Spanis's book too, which is going to be, I'll make a, a link available in the description box when we upload this on YouTube. So you can purchase her uh, oh, Hamilton you. versus Wall Street. Um, on Kindle or paperback, um, and yeah, get that out to your your community as well and your friends. I saw Luke momentarily Thank pop you. his hand up. Um, Luke, I'm, I'm presuming that meant you had a question? Well, I just, because of uh, Limari's question, I just wanted to ask uh, Nancy, uh, what was the role or what was the contribution of Alexander Hamilton uh, with the African Free School? I mean, I think that was also well, that he was, he, since he was on the, he was an officer of the New York Manumission Society, he was one of the sponsors, right? Uh, that's absolutely, that was part of the project. And he was also involved in setting up a school for Native Americans, uh, and uh, which ultimately became Hamilton College, actually, uh, still exists. I think I'm going to have to go, Matt. Okay, that's I not a problem. I think my stomach is calling because I have to make <laughs> dinner and before I, I'm getting a, a sort of a food headache. Not a worry, Nancy. <laughs> no, th thank you so much for uh, devoting your time and uh, and just teaching us about. Well, I really enjoyed oh, it. Uh, I hope I hope it was. I mean, I learned a lot preparing it, but uh, I hope it uh, was helpful to you all. Most well, certainly, yes. And for everyone, uh, just keep in mind, next week we got Larry, uh, Larry Freeman. The week following, we have Madeline Berrien. And then we're going to transition slowly through a little bit of poetry. And then a science curriculum will begin the following week after that. And people can go onto our website on the symposium section of risingtidefoundation.net and just take a look at all the different uh, features coming up. So thank you all for coming in. Okay. Nice thank you. Thank you. Good seeing everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day.